I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. I am a huge fan of this guest today, Zuby, he is a rapper, did it on his own. No label, got interested in rapping, started putting out his own albums and is now a huge success with it. But even more than that, he has recently released a fascinating course about how to be better at social media, particularly Twitter, build up a huge following, build up a loyal following, how to monetize that. It's a very interesting course, but it's not just about Twitter. It's about how to be a good, interesting human being. It's about storytelling. It's about conversation. It's about what goes viral while you're still being authentic. We talk about everything from rap to today's current polarizing environment to, I don't know, and we went, we went off on a thousand different directions. It was great. Here it is. So happy to have Zuby. I don't even know. It's like it's like you have to introduce everyone with a title. Like I have so and so, and he's done X. But most people, you really shouldn't label. It's not like you know, so and so is an accountant. Welcome to the podcast. It's like everybody is getting to the point where they should do multiple things in their lives, and it's possible to be successful at more than one thing in life, and particularly in what I'm calling the Great Reset, this new era of life that we're entering into after months of lockdown and a pandemic and so on, many of us are going to have to you know, either change our interests or finally get a chance to explore our interests and passions. And it's possible to succeed even if you, no matter how old you are, no matter what your responsibilities are, no matter what your excuses are. I don't know why I'm throwing this in the, in, in the intro to this, uh, but Zuby, who is about to come on, he's a rapper, a very good one. You might have seen some of his YouTube videos. He uh, is also a fitness expert, and he's um, not only has he done a bunch of online courses about fitness and books. I don't know if there are courses or books. We'll ask him. Uh, but uh, he also broke the woman's world deadlift deadlifting record or heavyweight lifting record, he'll describe it to us. And you might say, I, you keep saying he, and you just said he broke the woman's record. Well, we'll get to that also. And 
He also has a course about social media, in particular Twitter, which I'm really curious about called Conquering Twitter. But the course itself is valuable in so many ways. I think content creation is going to be one of the most important skills that we all need to learn in this new this, this, this great reset that we're in, like being able to tell a story, being able to provide value uh, to, to the people in your life and to the people around you in various ways is really important. And social media and mastering social media is one of those ways. Zuby's going to describe the amazing accomplishments he's had using social media, in particular Twitter. You might have seen him on the Joe Rogan show, on the Pomp show, on Brett Weinstein's show. You might have seen me on Zuby's show. But Zuby, welcome. How's it going, James? It's an honor to be here, man. That is the longest intro I've ever done for anyone. Uh, even more of an honor. Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Uh, I didn't mention also, you grew up in Saudi Arabia. What's that all about? You're in England now. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of confusing and everyone gets confused because of my accent. So I don't really sound British. So I was born in England. When I was one, I moved to Saudi Arabia. My parents worked over there for about two decades so I grew up in Saudi Arabia. I went to school there up until fifth grade, and then I came to the UK for boarding school. So I was back and forth between the two countries, um, UK and Saudi Arabia, for multiple years all throughout my secondary school. Um, I did well in school. I went to Oxford University, studied computer science, and then I started rapping when I was in university. I released my first album when I was in my second year. You, you, you started rapping? Like when you were a kid... Uh, in boarding school in Saudi Arabia, you must have been a big fan of rap and hip hop. Mm. Did you try then, not necessarily rapping your own lyrics, but were you just kind of like building the skill set a little bit by mimicking your favorite rappers and so on and, and, and rapping their songs? Yeah, I guess so. I wasn't doing it um, as any type of rehearsal or practice, thinking that I'd end up being a rapper. But uh, yeah, you know, I think a lot of rap fans or music fans in general like to rap along or sing along with their favorite songs. So, were you writing lyrics a lot? No, I wasn't. I didn't write any lyrics at all until I was in university. And did you understand how to do? I don't know. What are the other skills like a drum machine or anything like that? Uh, no, and I still don't. I don't produce beats. But um, when it comes to lyrics, uh, I've got that covered. So, so like right now, you would say as a rapper, your main skill is coming up with lyrics. And then I suppose there's some skill to using your voice kind of as almost like a percussion instrument in a weird way. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I feel like when people try to mimic the art of rap, uh, they rhyme every single line and it's just very obvious that they're not good. But with like really good rappers, there's breaks at odd points in, in a lyric and there's rhymes that seem to rhyme, but not quite. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, like what, what for you, what are the nuances? I, this is a, on a tangent, but I'm just fascinated by this because you, you released an album in one year after starting it, which defies the normal expectations about, oh, you got to be doing this for 10,000 hours. And so yeah. I like that you skipped the line, basically. Uh, what, what do you say were some of the, the, the nuances between a good rapper and a bad rapper? And, and, and once you pick up those nuances, you're able to learn quickly. Wow, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, what people consider a good rapper or a bad rapper is extremely subjective. Um, when it comes to rapping, there are so many different parts of it. There's the lyricism, wordplay, the message, you know, the vibe, the flow, the delivery, all these kind of things. So you can have, I, I consider myself like a fairly technical rapper. So I care a lot about, you know, intricate wordplay and rhyme schemes and lyricism and stuff like that. But with a lot of other rappers, especially a lot of the modern mainstream stuff, there's not actually that much focus on the lyrics. It's more about the sort of vibe and sometimes even the melody and the flow and stuff like that. But, um, you know, different, different people really like different things. With me, I like, you know, I'm an, I'm an intelligent guy, so I like, I like intelligent lyrics. I like stuff that makes me think, stuff that sort of is quite mind-blowing or... I, I really love the art form of rapping rather than just like, okay, the beat sounds good and the hook is catchy. I really like the intricacy of, you know, wordplay and stuff that's multi-layered and things like that. So that's the type of rapper that I am, which is, um, you know, for some people it's too technical and they don't really like it for that because it doesn't, it doesn't vibe with them. And the stuff that I put focus on isn't really stuff that they care about, but there's, there's just, it's such a wide genre of music. It's such an interesting art form. And yeah, there are a lot of different layers to it. But for me, what makes a 
what makes a great rapper to me is the combination of lyricism, flow, delivery, and message. I, I try to be able to do all of those things and do them well. And how much did the first album sell? And I, and I say that not in a greedy way, but it's mm. often a way to to measure these things. Like obviously, you, you, I don't think you put it out with a label. You sort of chose yourself oh, no. to you you you. you you skipped the label, which I think mm-hmm. is very good. And you chose yourself. You said, well, why do I have to wait for a label? I could just put out an album. This is the internet. Mm-hmm. And how did that do? How did you measure success? I sold 3,000 copies hand to hand. That is awesome. Yeah. That is great. That is more <laughs> than 99% of books sell and probably more than 99.999% of albums sell. Yeah, that's with zero marketing budget, no team, no manager, no label, anything. Um, and, and only one year of doing it. Yeah, I've been, yeah, I've been rapping for 10 months when I put out my first album. Like, let me ask you this. Like, I, since I was a kid, I've loved rap. In the 90s, I started my first company. I made websites for rap record labels. Okay. And I was thinking to myself, man, it's probably really hard. But do you think I can learn how to do uh, rap? Yeah, man. You're, you're, you're. I've it for 40 years. <laughs> you're, you're a smart guy, man. You, you know how to do a lot of things. I think you can. I think you could learn how to rap. It's it's a skill like anything else, you know. There's the element of talent, of course, and not everyone necessarily has like the sort of voice for it or like the the vibe for it. But anyone can learn how to rap. I think um, just like I think you have a good voice. You you have a great voice. Oh, I think that probably helps you a lot too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, vo- voice is definitely important. I mean, if you think of a lot of rappers, the first thing you'll sort of comes to your mind is their is their voice because. One thing with with rap is it's probably it's probably the genre of music where your voice is so important and distinct. I'd say I'd say even more so than singing in a weird way because a lot of singers unless you're really really into an artist, you wouldn't recognize their voice, right? Like if you just heard the singing, you wouldn't distinctly know, okay, this is that person. And there are only so many ways that you can sing well. Whereas with rapping, it's so individual and distinct and unique, right? 50 Cent sounds totally different to Snoop, who sounds totally different to Eminem, who sounds totally different to Jay-Z, right? It's, it's just, it's all totally different. But you know immediately, as soon as you hear Eminem's voice and flow, there's no question who that is. It's just like, yep, that's Eminem. Okay, that's Jay-Z. That's Nas. That's Tupac. Like, you just know straight off the bat. Whereas actually with a lot of other genres of music, um your finger, your personal footprint isn't on it so strongly. So, you know, and this has nothing, I mean, we've been talking about rap. I, there's, I really <laughs> want to talk to you about social media and That's your experience with it. And I want to talk about a ton of other things, but I am just, I am fascinated by skill acquisition and a lot of people love rap music. You just mentioned a bunch of rappers. They all have very, like you say, they all have very distinct styles in under no circumstances. Can you say Jay-Z is similar to Snoop and yet I, I love both of them. Mm. And then you see someone like Drake, who's, by the way, I, uh, next to Eminem, the top-selling rapper of all time. And I love his stuff, but I also say to myself, it doesn't really feel as skilled, but I think that's part of his skill. I'm not saying anything bad about him. I think he has this really great way of seeming really relaxed and playful mm. and injecting that into his songs. And I think that is a quality people often don't recognize uh and it's the obvious question but like what 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 rappers do you admire the most um my two favorite rappers are tech nine and jay-z those are my top two i mean i've got dozens of rappers who who i'm a huge fan of but for me those two are the top ones tech nine both with both of them both when it comes to rapping and music and catalog and also when it comes to what they've done in terms of business and entrepreneurship so myself being an independent rapper, you know, Tech Nine's probably the most successful independent rapper in the world. I've had the honor to open for him actually when he's performed Whoa. here in the UK as well. I mean, he's he's so underrated. Despite the fact that he's he's so, you know, he's he's well known and he's extremely successful, but when people are, you know, talking about I don't know, the top 5 rappers or the top 10 rappers, etc., it's quite rare to hear his name come in and, you know, he's he's up there. He's on Eminem level in terms of just raw talent and ability and just being a ridiculously insanely talented rapper. I love the fact that it didn't happen quickly for him. I love the fact that he kind of, you know, he's like peaking in his forties. And I think that's so dope because so many rappers, you know, they, they kind of peak really early and then stuff tails off for them. 
I admit I haven't really listened a lot to him. I'm gonna have oh, to yeah. um, Please do. listen to him. Um, and then what he's done with strange music is just it's totally phenomenal. It's absolutely inspirational. I just love how there's a lot of you know hip hop and rap have become these this laboratory for combining musical genres and creating something completely new out of it in this beautiful way. And I just I just love that. Yeah. There's a few things about hip hop and rap that make it actually really special as a genre. One of them is that it's it's one genre where it's totally, you know, 99% of rappers write their own lyrics, right? Like in lots of other forms of music, the person singing is not the person who wrote the song, whereas in, in hip hop, like that's really frowned upon. So you're really listening to the artist. It's also generally a self-taught art, right? Like people learn how to sing, but nobody has rap lessons. People don't really learn how to rap. You sort of just work it out and are influenced by different things. And then you just create your own style. There aren't any rules to it. And then another thing that's amazing about rap is you just have so much space to say what you want. I mean, if you look, if you were to take the, look up the lyrics of the average rap song, like if you were to look up the number of lyrics in one of my songs, it's probably eight times as many lyrics as a similar, you know, pop song or rock song. You've just got so much space to say whatever you want and there's no limits. You can, you can rap about anything, right? Like R and B, it's kind of limited what you can talk about, right? You know, love, romance, relationships. It's, you can't really go too far outside that wheelhouse. Rap, you can talk about all that, but you can, you can literally rap about anything. There are rap songs about everything under the sun. I feel like rap and maybe country are the two genres where you can just talk about absolutely anything. All right, rapping. And okay, you've done a couple of albums and you have, you have now, you're, you've opened, you're opening up for your all time favorite rapper. So you're, you're, you've gone beyond 3000 albums. <laughs> what, what, what's the latest? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've released five independent albums and five independent EPs to date. So eight, eight in total now. Um, and then, yeah. And you know, I'm totally independent. There's one thing a lot of people don't realize is I don't have a team. So many people think I've got like this team or like I've got some funding or whatever. It's like, nah, everything has been from when I released my first album, Commercial Underground. It's all been independent. I've been a full-time artist since November, 2011. That's when I left the corporate world and went out to become a full-time independent rapper. And so it's really, really been a grind to get to where I am now. And it's weird because in the past 18 months, not even di directly through my music, but probably 98% of people who have heard of me discovered me in the past 18 months, which is kind of bizarre considering I put out my first release in 2006. So it's been, um, the growth, the growth curve has been kind of, kind of strange and it's weird because so many people who know me now are actually unfamiliar with the sort of backstory. They've kind of just seen what I've done between then and now. So, um, well, what was your corporate job? I used to be a management consultant. I did that for three years. And when you, like, what would you go to like an oil company and say, hey, you guys should fire some people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was, it was a little bit more like IT based. So helping with IT implementations and strategies and stuff like that. So I worked with some big clients. I worked with like um, some, some very well-known global, global companies. And I, yeah, I did that for three years. Um, and when, when, already, you told, when you told JP Morgan, Hey, I'm going to stop this to be a rapper. What, what did JP say? <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's, it's funny. I mean, I kind of kept the world a little bit separate to people who, who knew me well, like everybody knew I was a rapper. I mean, by this point I'd already released a few albums and done a lot of live gigs and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I think people who knew me well, either inside work or outside of it, I don't think anyone was massively surprised because they knew that's where my heart was and they knew that's something I'd already been doing. But I guess, yeah, people who weren't familiar with my music or what I was sort of doing in my moonlighting, I guess, um, yeah, some people were sort of caught off guard by it a little bit or some people- Anyone try to give you advice? Yeah, I guess. But, you know, most people were, there wasn't that much resistance. Um, and my family, fortunately, are, you know, very supportive. My parents are- you know, my parents, I just saw my dad today. He was wearing one of my t-shirts. Like my parents are super, they're super supportive. Like every album I make, my mom makes sure she's the first person to buy it. Anything cool. I release, if I release like a new t-shirt or like when I release my book. In fact, my, 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 um, my mom got a little bit upset because I think my dad bought my book before she did. 
And so they had a little uh, bit of an argument about that because that sort of broke the tradition. But um, so great. yeah, but no, they're, they're super supportive. You know, before the lockdown, they came to my last gig that I did prior to um, this whole haven't performed this year, but you know, they came to the last show I did last year. And so, you know, I've got, a, I've got a fantastic backing in terms of like, you know, my family, my friends, and even, you know, even my, my fans and my supporters, I've just got such a wonderful support base whom I genuinely like and genuinely respect. And that's mutual. And actually, I don't think a lot of artists have that. I don't think a lot of public figures, et cetera, have that. There are a lot of musicians and actors and people in entertainment, et cetera, who actually have some resentment for their audience and their fan base. And I think there's a danger in art, any kind of art form. There's a danger in becoming the prisoner to your audience. Absolutely. And so like you have to, like if something hits and you're all, and you build a great audience because of one particular thing, you feel like, oh my gosh, I have to do that thing again. And mm -hmm. that's a very, that is the death of art and, and the death of basically growth as a human. I think that's how dangerous it is. I and, agree. uh, and you, you kind of allude to this in your course, or you talk about it directly in your course on Twitter. And so I wanted to this, this segues nicely into that because I think also you probably built a lot of audience from focusing on building out, I hate to call it your brand because it's not mm -hmm. quite that, but building yourself up on Twitter and social media. So maybe let's, let's veer into that. You, you, were, you start off on MySpace with, you know, MySpace was really a great uh, home for musicians but not the best. It was like this disorganized Facebook. And I think once mm. Facebook came along with verified identity and very organized pages, and then Twitter came along with the simplicity of 140 characters, now 280, social media really evolved. So let's start with YouTube because YouTube is a natural place for a musician and a rapper. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I started my YouTube channel actually in 2006. I wasn't up, I, like in hindsight, that's one of those things I would have gone harder on and been a lot more consistent on had I known sort of what it would be. I just upload a video, you know, a video of me rapping once in a while and that would kind of be it. I didn't upload any kind of regular content, but um, yeah, no, I think you, YouTube is fantastic. All of these platforms have been really interesting um, in seeing how they've developed things. What's interesting in, in my side is, um, you know, a lot of people know me sort of through the internet now, but actually for the first 10 years of my career, I was on social media and I was using it, but my primary fan base was coming through real world legwork, you know, from 2000 and I mean, I, I did it from the very beginning, but certainly from 2011 to up until about 2017, 2018, I mean, I would just hit different cities and sell my CDs on the street. That's how people knew me. Cause I was just always out there in every different city in the UK talking to strangers, shaking hands, passing out flyers, selling CDs. That's really how I built my name. I mean, I sold over 25,000 albums on the streets of the UK. So that's really how people got to know me. And then they tend to follow me on social media after that. In 2018, I had my first sort of, I mean, I've been on Twitter since 2009, but on 2018, I had one tweet, which sort of opened the floodgates quite a lot and started gaining me a whole bunch of followers actually from the USA. And it started sort of changing my audience quite greatly from one that was primarily invested and interested in my music to people who were just sort of interested in my brain and my ideas and my thoughts on things, whether that's social issues, cultural stuff, political stuff, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, in February 2019, I had that deadlift video, which totally went insane. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. Because <laughs> okay. what, what, what's fascinating about that is you know, you could kind of, you know, sort of tread water on, so there's, a, there's a lot of ways to build up on, on social media and you discuss, discuss this masterfully in your course, Mastering or Conquering Twitter. Um, but, you know, people often have like a slow and steady gain, sometimes up, sometimes down. But sometimes I feel like you need an outside like asteroid to hit your world uh, <laughs> in order for things to literally blow up. And so sometimes you think of like, what can I, how can I provide value on social media? But sometimes you have to think of what am I doing that I'm passionate about that can express an opinion I feel strongly about in the real world mm -hmm. and then bring it onto social media. And, and so I, that's an event, like yes. writing a book is an event or yes. 
you know, running for president. Kanye West, it's no secret. Kanye West announces he runs for president. That's an event because of someone that big, people take him seriously. His, the political party is called the birthday party. All right. Like it's not, <laughs> it, it is what it is. Like he just is doing this for lots of reasons, but it's no secret that his latest album dropped right after that. So he needed yeah. an event, an outside event to hit the, the, the orbit of his world, his musical world. And that was that. So, so for you, I feel like this was a great event because it was something you believed in, but describe what, what happened. Yeah, sure. So on, it was 26th of February, 2019, I posted a nine second video on Twitter of me doing a 230 kilo deadlift. And, um, I wrote in the tweet, something along the lines of, I keep hearing about how biological men have no strength advantage over women in 2019. So watch me destroy the British women's deadlift record without trying. P.S. I identified as a woman whilst lifting the weight. Don't be a bigot. And I just tweeted this out there like I do with everything else. Um, I, I've got over 80,000 tweets. I put a lot of stuff out there on a lot of topics. And I thought, okay, this is going to get a couple of laughs from my audience. I think it's kind of funny. And it went crazy. It went absolutely insane. I mean, that tweet has literally, the tweet alone has done over 12 million impressions, almost 3 million views. This is just on Twitter. Like it went viral off Twitter too. It went viral on Facebook, on Instagram. I was doing interviews. The interviews were going viral. The whole thing just went bonkers. Millions upon millions of people around the world ended up seeing this. I mean, you have to remember when I tweeted that, I had 19,000 followers and I got 310,000 now on Twitter. So that, yeah, it was crazy. And then um, it, it, the, the mainstream media started picking up on it. I was doing interviews with, you know, BBC, the Sunday Times, Sky News, Joe Rogan picked up on it and, you know, talked about it on his show and started following me on social media and things just grew and grew and grew. I, <laughs> when you did it, did you think to yourself, oh, I'm going to show them. I'm going to break. <laughs> I, just thought it, I just thought it was kind of funny. I just, <laughs> but like, like I were you thinking of that you wanted to do that tweet so then you did the video? Or did you do the video and like you were like, okay, I want people to see this video. Uh, I'll tweet this funny mm. thing I just thought of. Okay, like, so here, okay, here's the funny thing. That video was already online and it had like 50 views because it was just part of one of my training sessions. So a lot of people think I shot that video to make the tweet. No, I already had, I already had the video on my phone because it was sometimes I film parts of my workouts and it was just yeah. sort of a generic workout. I film um, parts of my workouts too. Yeah. <laughs> so I had it on my phone. You know, I'd seen all these stories coming out about, you know, the, the transgender athletes thing. And it was just like, okay. And then out of curiosity, I thought, oh, you know what? I'm really good at deadlifting. I wonder what the British women's deadlift record is in my weight class. So I just searched it and I was like, oh, I can, I can destroy that. It's like 60 kilos less than my max. So I was like, okay, oh, I already had that video on my phone. I'm not even maxing out or anything. And the video was just there. So I just took it, you know, attached it to the tweet, made the tweet and thought, okay, this is going to get a few laughs, not knowing that it would end up being this sort of life-changing, honestly, life-changing moment for me that just catalyzed so many things. The amount of people who discovered me off of that but then are now fans of, you know, my music or my podcast or me in general or who have bought my book, et cetera. So much of it came from that flash point. But then because of all the work I've done in the decade leading up to it, people saw that, okay, there's, there's more to this guy than just this tweet. Cause it's not rare for a tweet to go viral. Tweets go viral every day. But in my case, I, I myself went viral, right? It wasn't just the tweet. It was like, oh, actually this guy is this guy is interesting. That's how I ended up getting on the Rogan podcast. That's how, you know, I ended up getting invited to the white house. That's how I ended up doing all the things that I did. Um, did you just and, get and like still uh, doing. an invitation in the mail? Like, please, <laughs> please come to the new year's Eve ball at the white house. The president and first lady would request your presence. <laughs> not, not, not quite. So, I mean, this is like seven months after this. So I went to the U S to do some podcasts in, September. So I spent September to November last year in the U.S. I went to 10 different cities. So I went out there to do, um, you know, the Rubin Report, the Joe Rogan Experience, ended up, you know, doing the Ben Shapiro Show, Adam Carolla Show, dozens and dozens of podcasts. And then actually I was in, um, I'd been in Nashville for a week for a cousin's wedding. And then my next stop was D.C. And I actually just tweeted, I'm going to be in D.C. next week. I wonder if anyone can help me get into the White House. 
And I didn't know that there are people in the administration who follow me on social media. I had no idea. And I ended up getting two invitations the following week to come visit the White House. I'm sure people have asked you about this before, but what happened then? Did you go to the Oval Office and hang out? And- yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't get to meet the president, unfortunately. A lot of people asked me if I, if I got to meet Trump. I, did, I didn't. Um, but I, yeah, I got a tour of like, you know, a full tour of the place, the West Wing. I did, yeah, check out the Oval Office, got some cool photos in the vice president's office. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I actually went back the following day as well and got, got a larger tour, including the, um, what's it called, the Eisenhower Building. And yeah, it, it was cool. It was it was just a cool experience. Um, I got invited to the Pentagon as well because one of my, it turns out one of my fans works there, so he invited me. That's Being great. in the states was incredible. I mean, in the U.S. was was crazy. Every single city I went to, the amount of love I received. Um, I was just I ended up doing meetups in five different cities, just um, inviting people to come hang, going out for dinner, and it was just cool. It was amazing. First off, what's interesting with your event is that. Obviously, you're in great shape, and so deadlifting, you know, this amount <laughs> was part of what you do. But yeah. again, you're kind of combining all these different intellectual threads. Like there, sure. there's all this. It's a very complicated issue, actually. Like what it, you know, right now at least, mm. people are very. You're if if you're not polarized and if you're centrist about it, you know, people have different opinions on what gender is. So, sure. you know, and a lot of people think. Everything, by the way, there's the whole spectrum of everything, which is why J.K. Rowling uh, is being denounced so heavily now because she's standing up for the rights of biological women and not saying that that d- takes away from the rights of transgender women. She's yeah. actually acknowledging that there's more than two genders and mm-hmm. let's respect the rights of all these genders. And I think that's very interesting. So I have this discussion with my daughter a lot that you know transgender women um, should go to uh, should be allowed in the, the bathrooms of women. And that issue doesn't bother me either way, but I always, I do kind of think that, Hey, if women fought for rights, Mm -hmm. you don't have to take away your rights just to give men who convert to women, some of your rights, like everybody should fight for their own rights. (laughs) And you kind of make this point very brilliantly by Mm -hmm. You know, because sports events, so I, I described you to my daughter in this discussion, and I, I said what you did, and her view was that, in general, transgender women wouldn't want to enter women's sports events because it wouldn't be very respect. You know, she just would assume that everybody's fighting for each other's rights, but mm-hmm. that is not really what happens in the real world, I find. <laughs> so you, so you yeah. made the interesting point that, hey, if, if they're telling me I can identify as a, wi- a woman and that's all that gender is, well, yeah. I'm going to make a statement about that using a skill that I have as a man. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's such an obvious point. I mean, the whole thing is absurd. Like it, it's a really absurd when, especially when it comes to the sports thing, I think it's really absurd. I think, um, and a, you know, I think, I think vast majority of people see this and know this, like it's a very tiny percentage of people who don't, who think that that's, it's okay to have someone who just simply identifies as a woman competing against actual women. But, but, but this um, is where you realize majority versus minority doesn't matter in yeah. the sense that often the most extreme views and the exactly. views that actually take over society mm-hmm. were held by just two or three, all you need is two or 3% of the people. Yep. And then everyone else sort of like, I don't, I don't really know what this phenomenon is called or why it happens, but somehow or other society falls for the 3% who, mm-hmm. who, who have an extreme opinion, maybe because yeah. most people don't care. And so the people who care, like, oh, they care so much. I should probably pay attention. Yeah. Look, uh, cowardice is like, cowardice is the real pandemic that's going on. Like most people are just, I don't want to say most people are cowards because that sounds so like harsh, (laughs) but a lot of people, cowardice is a, is a real problem in, in society. And well, I think, I think cowardice or let's, you're right. It's a harsh word. Let's just say lack of, I don't want to say lack of bravery either. There's yeah. like the, the default setting is to not disagree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look, I think some of it is some, there, there's, there's a level of ignorance. Like there's people who just aren't aware of a certain issue, right? Just naive. And that's fine. That's, you know, just uninformed. Then there are people who are sort of apathetic and sometimes it's okay to be apathetic. You don't need to have a strong opinion on everything, but then there are times when people know what is right and what is wrong and what is true and what is false but they just acquiesce because they don't want to 
They don't want to face any kind of backlash or criticism. They don't want to rock the boat, et cetera. And I do consider that cowardice, to be honest. Um, I think there, there are certain lines that, you know, society does need, things can be very malleable and we live in very free societies, the freest societies in the world. But at the same time, you know, you do need boundaries and borders on certain things. And there are some things which are just like, okay, no, we need to draw a line there, especially if it's something that has, you know, safety risks or security risks or something that's just clearly unfair or clearly immoral, etc. So, you know, society has to draw lines. You can't just allow everything because you're worried that like one person in 10,000 is going to not like it or something. But you particularly know? now though, where you say one thing and uh, you know, you, you, you could be, this, this used to never happen. Like this did not happen where somebody would be banned from a Twitter account or banned yeah. from a YouTube account that didn't exist. In fact, I don't even know, I'll have to look this up. I don't know where the laws changed, but there was very publicly a case in, I believe it was 1997, someone on Prodigy, which was a, an antique social network from the 90s. It disappeared mm. a long time ago and basically AOL uh, uh, passed it. But there was this social ser service, Prodigy. Someone made a post about uh, Nazis or whatever. Another person sued that person and you know, saying it was hate speech. And the way the law came down on this, and I thought this was still the standard, was that if a company either censors everything, meaning you have to look at everything that comes through and mm -hmm. you're obligated to remove all hate speech or you censor nothing. And that was for a long time until, I don't know when, like I feel like just a few months ago, that was the standard. <laughs> So I don't know if the law has changed or if people are ignoring that law because it was a long time ago, but that, that was the law. Yeah, well, I think the problem is there's the whole platform versus publisher debate. So platforms like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, et cetera, are they considering themselves open platforms or are they considering themselves publishers? Because if they're publishers, and which is what they really are, right? They do act as publishers then they would lose some of the protections that they currently have, right? They would be made to be responsible for whatever content exists and is uploaded to their platforms, just like a newspaper would be or, you know, a mainstream media, right? If, if, some, if a newspaper's website or a big media website puts out something that is, you know, untrue or uncalled for or, you know, contains threats or whatever. Right, they then make you, a retraction. Then you, exactly. Then, then, yeah, they can make a retraction. You can also sue them. But if I go on Facebook and I just go write something crazy on Facebook or on Twitter, um, Twitter, is, Twitter is protected from that, right? Because I'm, it's user-generated content, right? They can't be expected to keep an eye on absolutely everything. But like you said, it has to, be, it has to kind of be one or the other. Right. That was um, the whole point of this law is that if they're platforms yeah. and not publishers, mm -hmm. then you actually have – then free speech kind of goes down from the Constitution into yeah. these platforms. Yeah. And you know what? Like my position is, I think, look, platforms can, private companies can have their, they can have their own rules. So if you wanted to have a rule like, okay, no porn on YouTube. Fair enough. Right. My, the problem with the, the problem with it is that the rules are open to interpretation and they're subjective in many cases, and also that they're not applied fairly and equally. So there can be situations where one person literally posts a death threat or a call to violence on Twitter and they're aware of it and it's totally fine. And that tweet is still up there one year later. And then someone who is, you know, most likely on the other side of the political spectrum, you know, I got temporarily suspended for saying, okay, dude. Right. I saw someone get suspended. Um, was it an algorithmic suspension you think? Or no, was it, no, no, was it wasn't. It was because it was manually reviewed by a human and they upheld it. They right. upheld it. Wow. They upheld it. Yeah. But, but you're because on I, Twitter now. You're back on Twitter. Uh, yeah, I'm back. But I had to delete my tweet saying, okay, dude, in order to be let back on Twitter. Like they had a conversation with you or an email discussion? Well, they emailed me to tell me I was locked out of my account. I made an appeal and it was manually reviewed by a human. So a manual human looked at that tweet, saw that it said, okay, dude. And they said that this violates their hateful conduct policy. That's, that's and, what happened. Okay. Let, let's steel man the argument, meaning... Mm -hmm let's argue their side for them. Like, and, and let's say you were wrong and they were right. How would you argue their case? Okay. They're only, the only way this could have happened 
in their lunatic minds is that they saw that. So the person who I said, okay, dude, in response to after they said that they were bragging about them sleeping with more women than me, which is like a weird thing to brag about, especially given I was in a relationship. Um, but anyway, and I didn't even know, I don't even know who I'm talking to. Like I reply to people on Twitter. Anyway, it turned out this person was a transgender individual. So their interpretation of this, which is literally the, the most weirdest mind reading, least charitable interpretation one can make is that I know that this person is biologically male, but is identifying as a female. And I said, okay, dude, very specifically to, despite dude being a gender neutral term, that I said, dude, because this is to misgender them or attack or insult them in some way by calling them a dude while they are identifying as a woman. Yeah, that's the only way it could be interpreted. Right. So you, you, for them. In, in this worst interpretation of what you said, mm -hmm. and, and like you said, I'll, we, I'll assume you didn't know they were transgender, but mm -hmm. the worst interpretation is you did know and you deliberately used the word dude to insult them. So yeah, that's again, the, that's people the, insult the, each other on Twitter. Like I, I of course. someone calls me an idiot. Someone calls me a, a jackass literally every day <laughs> on course. Twitter. So, yeah. so like, Oh, you're you're not allowed. Like, why weren't you allowed specifically to insult someone in that case? Or, or is there? Would you yeah, first of all, this is I the feel thing, like there's got to be a stronger argument. Well, no, that's all it is, and it's not even an insult. Like, it's it's there's nothing there's nothing insulting about it. I say okay, dude, to everybody. Like, it's not um yeah. the statement wasn't even targeted at the person. It's I say okay, dude. Like I say, okay, whatever. So, like, so you or, really don't think there's a stronger way to make this argument? And I I believe you if if you well, if, well the, the I mean, how, what, what is the strongest argument to suspend someone under a hateful conduct violation for them uttering the words, okay, dude? Yeah. Like, I mean, is, <laughs> like, is it any way, is any way, could that be like for your, let's say you have a, a huge amount of followers and they all know who this person is. Could that in any way be inciting your followers to also be angry at this person? Not really. By saying, okay, dude. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to put it, myself it, in the it, mindset. It's, it's not, that's why, that's why the whole thing was so absurd. That's why it was so but, absurd because it's like there, there was no, like I told the story to people and, um, you know, people are, I, I still have people who are like, oh, you must have like, there must be more to it, you know? <laughs> no, and, and I'm not you know? saying that, like, by the way, all yeah. I'm saying is I always try to argue the opposite side's case sure. better than, let's just assume they're stupid. Mm -hmm. How, how can I argue it even better than they would so that mm -hmm. I, so that if I was advising them. No man, this is how you should defend what you did to Zuby. Mm -hmm. What would how would I think about it? But I can't yeah. really get there be, with this. Yeah, no, they, the only way is to claim that I deliberately inverted commas misgendered a a trans individual who is supposedly part of some protected class and I did this by saying the word dude and I somehow magically knew that this person was whoever they the like there's no there's no it, the whole thing was ridiculous it was so, it was ridiculous right because obviously i'm 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 assuming you have nothing against transgender people and, okay. and no nobody has anything against transgender people really like there's just but somehow the language around this has become so sensitive mm -hmm. uh you even addressed this the other day in a tweet where you were talking about you know how to judge people who put their pronouns out there and he had a funny <laughs> tweet which by the way that was if i was twitter i'd look more at that than what you <laughs> fine. Well, out that, of my eighty thousand tweets i've definitely said stuff that's like a little more egregious than that yeah and, and by the way it's so easy like you said earlier so like uh, what is it the ruler of iran the Khomeini, the ayatollah Khomeini, oh, yeah. um said you know oh yes <laughs> there's going to be a strong um uh, uh retaliation from the iran from iran uh -huh. to the u.s Oh, you mean you're going to try to kill 300 million people? Let's just mm -hmm. leave that up on Twitter. Oh yeah. All, all so, the and what about all the Antifa stuff? All the Antifa stuff is on there. You have people like talking about pulling down statues or throwing milkshakes at people or beating people up in the street or there there's a lot of stuff on I and mean, some of it comes from verified accounts, right? You have people who like wish death upon other people, right? There's people oh, who yeah. You know, Boris, remember, I don't, like here in the UK, I mean, a few months ago, right, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson got COVID. And there were people, a lot of people on Twitter talking about how they hope he dies and they hope that his wife gets it. 
and you're just like, you know, and that stays on Twitter. Like it's, it's and, there literally and, people and, like, I hope he dies. And you're just like, okay. And meanwhile, if you say, if you say something like, you know, I really hope they open up the economy soon because there's 55 million people getting unemployment mm -hmm. and a lot of them are starving and a friend of mine killed himself and this, 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 somebody will always reply. And I'm so tired of this response, but somebody will always reply. <laughs> oh, you'd rather your grandma die oh just so you can make some, a little bit more money. And I'm like, when has making money ever correlated with grandma's dying? Like, it's just, yeah. no, I don't, nobody wants anybody to die. Want the virus to stop being, yeah, anyway, that's. Yeah, no, I, I posted, I posted a picture, you know, of, of me at the beach with my nieces and nephews today. And, you know, some people were saying, were, were saying that I'm being irresponsible for being at a beach. <laughs> Look, people, some people are just ridiculous. And I think they always have been. It's just that we see it now. But they never have been as outspoken because now people are getting banned. So if people are yeah. loud enough, they could cancel you. You know, they can't cancel you specifically because you've you've um, built your career in such a way as everyone should to be independent of opinion and and to rise above that, which I think mm -hmm. is is the key not only as a Twitterer but as a human being. Yeah. But it's it does astonish me how like for all the people saying, "Boy, I, I hope Boris Johnson dies of coronavirus." Um, if you say, if you say back to them, well, I hope you die of coronavirus. If you just say the exact same thing, mm -hmm. you get, you, you get, yeah. And they get hurt. <laughs> they get yeah. and like, why did you say that? Like, I don't, yeah. you, you want me to die? Take it back. Like yeah. it's, and, and, but you can't even, you can't even go down that rabbit hole because it's never going to make sense. You no, the, never it's ask a, why it's a rigged game, man. It's a rigged game. And, um, that's just the reality of it. I mean, anyone who's more like, you know, conservative or right leaning is already aware of this and has been for years, right? By the it's way, like, anybody who's centrist on the left, you're, oh, yeah. you're also a fascist. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, well, it's it's getting to them, but like what I mean is more right leaning people have been we people have been talking about this for years. Yeah. Right. And it's only now that, you know, oh, now it's a JK Rowling, right? Now it's like it's it's starting to get closer. <laughs> right. Yeah. When when Alex Jones got banned and when Milo Yiannopoulos got banned, people were like, Oh, well, we don't like those guys anyway, right? And then it creeps in and it creeps in. And it creeps in. Oh, now you're next in the firing line, right? People think that they're good. It's like, no, everyone's, everyone's going to get guillotined, man. But some people think as long as it's a certain distance from them and it's happening to people they don't really like, then they sort of celebrate it or just stay silent on it. But it will come for everybody, which is why, you know, I recommend to people like, look, just have principles. And having principles, sometimes you mean you need to defend and stand up for people who you, you don't even like and totally may disagree with, right? If something happens to I agree them, with that. which is like unfair, right? There's a lot of accounts on Twitter. There are a lot of people on Twitter, social media, who I find their views reprehensible. I don't like them at all. I disagree with them on almost everything, but you know what? I don't want their, I don't, I'm not trying to deplatform them. I don't want them to have their livelihoods taken away. I don't want to come after their podcast sponsors. I'm not, I don't wish any harm on them at all. And to me, that's like, you know, that's the malicious part. And not everyone has those principles. In fact, it seems like it's quite rare for people to take that really principled approach, you know? Um, and I think that unless people do, I don't know, things are going to get more divided and more polarized, certainly online, but it also slips into the real world as well. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. 
So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. So this, this, all of these things are different ways of segueing into the mastering social media and mastering oh, yeah. Twitter, because uh, it sort of seems like that the, the deadlifting exercise that you did and, and then the tweet uh, about, Hey, you just identified as a woman and uh, you, you broke the woman's deadlifting world record. It's funny. 
and, mm-hmm. and it goes viral. I'm sure you had a backlash too. Like people were upset, which kind of feeds the viral. Like everybody, you, you <laughs> fed everyone and Twitter yeah. probably made a lot of money. So they're like, yeah, probably. Keep, keep that tweet going because yeah. everyone's arguing. <laughs> 30 million people are arguing. This guy's good for us. Yeah. And um, I mean, I mean, quite literally, you could, you could analyze like 30 million views and let's say Twitter gets even a $10 CPM on ads, then yeah, you made them a good $300,000 <laughs> on that one tweet. Probably. Yeah, uh, so they, they should never ban me. Yeah, exactly. You should tell them, I made you guys $300,000. Yeah. So unless you pay me part of that, you shouldn't <laughs> ban me. But uh, I think the event probably was the first step in propelling your Twitter account. It's not that easy for people to, you know, a lot of people are just sit there tweeting, hoping that their Twitter uh, numbers go up. But I think mm-hmm. the outside world has to play a role as well. Yeah, I think there are, you know, you don't need to go viral on Twitter to grow. It certainly helps to be amplified to brand new people. But if you constantly offer value, and by value, I typically mean everyone's online for one of two reasons, um, and sometimes both, right? People either want to learn something or they want to be entertained. And that's all it is. Any content creator, whether they're a YouTuber, a podcaster, someone on Twitter, someone on Instagram, et cetera, any good account who has a lot of followers and has an audience, people like them because either they are informative or, and they are entertaining. And I think the that, and is important that's all too. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you can do, you can do both simultaneously and you can kind of jump back. But I, I think I do both, right? Like people find my stuff entertaining. Um, you know, my music, my podcast, just some of my little comments and stuff I put out there. So people find it entertaining, but also it's informative because I'm a free thinker and I have ideas and I like to generate conversations and I'll talk about stuff and say things that a lot of people will think, but won't say, and I'll just sort of say it and put it out there. And so people like that. I get a lot of people messaging me like, oh, you got me to think about this differently, or I'd never thought about that. I try to inspire, motivate people. So I'm constantly adding, adding value, right? I run everything through that filter. Is this informative? Is this teaching people or informing people of something? Or is this entertaining? Or is it maybe both? And if you can hit both, then that's, that's just, you know, super powerful. So A lot of people don't think of social media in this way and they just sort of put out stuff very mindlessly and they just, they're, they're just in consumption mode, right? Just consume, 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 scroll, 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 swipe, swipe, swipe. And with me, I'm a lot more deliberate and intentional, but at the same time, it's not in a contrived way. So what I recommend to people is being, you know, being very authentic, you know, doing things off of the cuff. You don't need to sort of pre-plan and engineer everything, but run everything through that filter of like, okay, is this entertaining? Is it informative? Is it something I would find interesting? And then just, you know, keep, keep firing away. Just keep firing. You'll keep shooting, especially on Twitter, because you can tweet 30 times a day and nobody, nobody cares. Like, that's totally fine. So you can just keep putting stuff out there. Yeah, because the thing is with Twitter, uh, you know, let's call it the open rate or the view rate. If people are just scrolling down the feed and you're throwing stuff up in there, the odds of or essentially something like two or 3% of followers will see any one tweet, um, mm-hmm. not counting the retweets. Sure. So yes, if something's great and it's retweeted, then more people will see it. Mm-hmm. But in general, if there was no such thing as retweeting and you put a, a tweet out there, only 2% of your followers, maybe 3% of your followers will see it. Mm-hmm. Best case. When you, when you, do you sit down and say to yourself, okay, I'm going to really try to tweet something now or do you already have, do you have something you and you, you're eating breakfast and you're like, Oh, I'm just thinking man. of something interesting. I want to tweet that. I've just got a hyperactive brain, man. Like my yeah. brain is constantly just, <laughs> is just constantly thinking of stuff like from morning to night. Right. I just, let's, let's, let's tweet something right now. So, uh, trending on Twitter is, um, for me is a civil rights leader, John Lewis, his funeral, Michelle Obama has got a podcast. Uh, Something Anthony is is trending. I don't know why. Maybe something sports related. Um, former presidential candidate Herman Cain has died after contracting COVID nineteen. Yeah, that's I it. note by the way they didn't say he died from COVID nineteen. So yeah. I, I I I don't know. Something feels a little fishy there to me. I, I didn't. I think he may have had a type of cancer. Um, don't quote me on that. But I think he had an some serious. We're getting close to a tweet now. Yeah. 
this is this is okay. So U.S. Uh, then the U.S. Post Office is trending, which um, someone's saying USPS is a public service, not a business. Um, Postal Service may close offices, cut services ahead of election, and I think that's a great thing. The U.S. Postal Service is a great example that the government should not be running something <laughs> critically important to human livelihoods. Like I would much rather uh, prefer sending a letter with Federal Express. Yeah. That's so I, I feel like, well, okay, let's narrow in. Let's, let's, let's tweet. Let's find something to tweet about here. Oh, wow. Uh, I, I mean, it doesn't even have to be a trending topic. I don't normally even look at the trending topics, I, I'm, but I'm but already a, to, uh, at least two of those trending topics annoyed me. Oh, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, just, and by the way, thought. I'm not like an easily annoyed or angry <laughs> person, but it seems like obviously they're taking the U.S. post office, which by the way, nobody ever liked in the United States, but suddenly it, you know, this becomes one of these political uh, things. Like it must be that, you know, whatever, Trump or Biden, somebody's doing something to someone. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, if you want to like double your engagement, all you do is use the word Trump. If you like, you can double, triple your engagement just by mentioning him. That's, that's right. A, that's a pretty solid rule. <laughs> and I, but, I, but but I but I don't quite like that either because I see yeah. a lot of people who just who just like play for the team yeah. and whether it's Democrat or Republican and mm-hmm. they get like a thousand new followers. They get. Yep. I mean, I get. I see it's people, easy to do. Yeah, like if you're just if if you're like uh, someone who has let's say a couple hundred followers, but you know some big celebrity who's polarized on one side or the other likes your stuff mm-hmm. and retweets you, you'll suddenly get 30,000 tweets if you mention Trump or Biden or whatever. And uh, I think that's too easy because it's mm-hmm. not really, you, then it's like a, a strategy rather than being yourself. It is. And also, you know, not everything's just about numbers. I mean, what's the audience that you want to gain? Do you just want, you know, if you want, okay, like a partisan political audience, that's probably one of the easiest ones to get. Like if you, if you're honest, right. If you just go sort of full MAGA or you go full anti-Trump, it's an easy way to gain followers, but those followers you gain are going to just going to keep wanting that. And it's just going to be a certain type of person. Like with me, I mean, that's why I'm very careful. Like I'm not, I'm not even careful. Like I'm just authentic. I'm just me. I just talk about what I want to talk about. I don't really filter, you know, I filter my opinions a little bit cause I don't want to get banned. But I don't, I don't run things through too hard a filter and I don't sort of totally play to any crowd. Like, it's funny because people accuse me of doing that, but I really don't do it. Like, I just sort of say what I think is true and is fair. And as a result, I do have a very diverse audience and an audience that's genuinely tolerant because I've probably tweeted something that like every single one of my followers has disagreed with at some point, surely. So... I don't just sort of, yeah. And that's what I recommend for people too. Before you were talking about people being sort of held hostage by their own audience. And a great way to do that is to just be a one trick pony and to, you know, just kind of go hard down one line. And then, you know what, if you do have a time where you want to say something that is not down that line, and then suddenly people are going to unfollow you and going to start yelling at you. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's not the way forward. I don't think. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And like, and then sometimes like, let's just take this U.S. Post Office Service thing. There's also this aspect where I could comment on this and will I go through a similar filter to you. I think to myself, is this educational? Is this entertaining? And, I'm, and am I afraid to tweet it? I like to have a little bit of fear <laughs> on my side because then I know I'm probably saying something fairly new, yeah. right? Like if you put out a song that you're a little afraid that you believe it's a quality song, but you're a little afraid to put it out for some reason, like you're taking some, doing some experiments mm-hmm. it's because you're doing something new and you're, you're expanding your comfort zone, maybe the comfort zone of the genre. And you know, that, I don't know, for me, that's, that's interesting way to yeah. think about it. And um, so I could say, well, look, what helps people is to really rise above all the arguing and the hate. Um, but at the same time, people need to understand this is a great example of basic economics. Like there's a reason why I would trust Federal Express more than the U.S. Post Office. So it makes sense. Money either goes into the post office or it goes into the innovation economy where entrepreneurs are creating jobs and technologies and so on. That's, a dollar could only be one place at a time. Mm-hmm. So 
that there's an educational aspect there uh, to post it. But then I consider, well, there are people who have jobs at the post office and I don't really want to say anything. I don't want people to feel like I'm against them having employment and feeding their families. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I take a lot of things into account, not to try to protect anybody, but I just, mm-hmm. I look at it full circle and that's kind of my process. I don't know if it's, yeah, it's successful or not. It's a tricky one to do, especially once you have a large audience, because anything that's remotely interesting is going to upset somebody. That's just yeah. the reality of it, right? If you've got, you know, 50,000, 100,000, 200,000, a million followers, the more you have, you're always going to step on somebody's toes. There's always going to be someone who takes it personally or who thinks it's like about them. This is something people do on social media all the time is they like think everything is they think everything is targeted at them. So you can just make sort of a general, a very general statement or comment. And then someone takes it personally, even though of course it had nothing to do with them. And you probably didn't even know that person followed you. Um, this, this really happens a lot. So you just make a general statement about like, I don't know. Or, or you just say something like, you know, just the term or people take issue with the terminology used. Like the other day, um, I was saying something about, I was saying something about laws and I was saying essentially how, if you really think about it, every law is enforced under the threat of violence, right? Yeah. So you want to be so that's careful. That's a big uh, libertarian plank. Yeah. So you want to be careful about making dumb laws, basically, because you don't want to have a law which is going to put someone in conflict potentially with like a police officer, which could get violent, unless it's something that is worthy of that. And when I said something about it, I said something about um. I used the I used the term goons. I said I I said I said something about the government sending their goons, and then like a couple of people who work in law enforcement who follow me were like you know took issue with the fact that I used the word goons, and it was like oh gosh, like <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I just I, I use the term goon just to mean like enforcer, right? It doesn't even like I wouldn't typically, and, and so with anything like that, or you make a joke and oh, this joke is, you know, someone takes issue with it because of that. Comedians deal with the same thing, right? They, they make a joke about this and it turns but, out but that comedians, But comedians can say at the end, it's just a joke, everyone. Yeah. It can say, and then it's, then it's all systems off. Like, it's okay. Uh, no, not, at, not these days. Not these days, but <laughs> still a days. little bit more than, like, like a comedian can say something about transgenders a little bit more easily than Jordan Peterson can. Oh, I don't know about that, man. I don't know about that. I know Jordan Peterson is more, is less fearful to say it. Like, I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, comedians are, comedians are like shook right now, man. Spe- yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on who your audience is. Like, are you a prisoner? It's always in that spectrum of, are you the prisoner of the audience or mm-hmm. are you uh, creating art? And yeah. that's really, and that's a spectrum, let's say from zero to 10. And, yeah. and it's, and I'm not criticizing anyone for, for being a prisoner of the audience. It happens. I don't know if it ever happened to you, Zuby, but it's, it happens to a lot of people where sure. you write something, it hits. Like I had a period where I was writing about being bankrupt and bouncing back from it and being suicidal and depressed and people really liked it and responded to it. And I felt I was adding value and people mm-hmm. could see how I, people could relate. And so it became a point where I was afraid to not do something like that. And okay. that was a very ugly feeling. Like I hated myself at that mm-hmm. point. I had to... I had to not think about that when I, when I wrote. Yeah. And you know, sometimes you have to sort of not, you know, you, you can't be, again, you, you know, you can't be held ransom by like feedback either. And I think that's positive or negative. I mean, there's always going to be feedback and everyone's going to have their opinions. And like I said, the the bigger the audience, the more that's going to be, but you can't let that stop you and control the whole process. Right. If I want to put something out there, I can't, I, I can't consider it from every single angle as to, you know, as if I do that, I'll just bite my tongue all the time. Like I'll never, yeah. I'll never do anything. I'll never say anything. I'll never do anything interesting. If you're constantly worried about criticism, then you literally can't do anything, right? We can't record this podcast because, you know, there might be someone on YouTube who says like, oh, you know, da, da, da. And it's like, well, if that's what you're worried about, then you just won't, you just won't do anything. And yeah, so, or I almost like thinking about it where, where the more criticism I do get, the more, the more I know I'm going in the right path. So mm-hmm. it's just like, I'm sure when you left um, your job as a management consultant to become a rapper, I'm sure there were a few people who said, Zuby, you cannot do that. Like, don't be an idiot. Like, you can't mm-hmm. do that. And you know, at that point, okay, 
this shows me this is the exact direction for me. Like if this person is specifically this person is saying you can't do it and I know their track record on the decisions in their life <laughs> means I probably am making a good choice here. And God, I, yeah. if, if most people on Twitter says you can't say that, I'm probably correct in saying that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, people don't like the truth. You know, truth hurts is a very, it's an overused phrase, but it's so true. It's so, so like, true. So like, uh, uh, you know, and, and I always ap appreciate what you're saying about when, when you're being authentic, it also doesn't mean a lot of people might say, oh, well, he's just a contrarian, but it's never, that's never true. Like contrarians mm -hmm. don't think of themselves as contrarians. Then they're just stupid. Then it's just like, <laughs> oh, I don't like breathing in the morning. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> like, I'll, I just say what I think. And it's not interesting if I'm saying the same thing everyone else is thinking. So mm -hmm. of course I'm all, I'm going to filter. People don't know all my thoughts. I'm going to yeah. filter to say something interesting. So it's going to seem contrarian because mm -hmm. it might be something I believe in that a lot of other people don't believe in. So yeah. that will seem contrarian to others. But to me, it just seems like one of my thoughts. Yeah. And you know, we, we've all got different personalities. And um, I think one thing I've certainly learned is that I care a lot less about approval of others than most people do. Why do you think that is? I think it's just my personality. I think I'm just, I think I'm just wired that way. Like, You're very I like don't. calm. And we, we even spoke about this on your podcast. You're like, you yeah. seem like a, you give off a very calm vibe. I am. And you know, I did, um, I did do like a fairly in-depth personality test a couple of years ago, and I'm actually in the bottom 2% of the entire population in neuroticism. So I experience negative emotion less than 98% of people. So that wow. totally explains it, you know, and I do don't you ever, you ever do a study of your neurochemicals. Like, do you have a high? Oh, I've never done that. I wonder if, if they could tell if you have like a high level of uh, serotonin in general or, you Maybe. know, serotonin is this, this neurochemical where you just, oh, you were on Brian, I don't know, Brian Keating, the physicist. There's mm -hmm. Andrew Huberman at Stanford does a lot of studies on this. So serotonin is this neurochemical for um, just being general satisfied in life. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I have incredibly high levels. Cause I mean, I I've got a super long temper. Like I pretty much don't get angry. I'm totally immune to like anxiety, depression, stuff like, like I, you know, and so I didn't know it was that extreme. When I learned I was like bottom 2%, I was like, okay, now my life makes a lot more sense. Cause I often, cause I think most people sort of view themselves. If I view myself around the average, then that really offsets things. So knowing that, okay, if I'm in a building full of people and the building catches fire, I'm probably going to be the calmest person in the building, right? If there's a pandemic going on, I'm going to be freaking out far less than most people, right? So everyone like yelling and screaming and whatever, I'm not even, I'm just looking at them looking a little confused. If I'm running late for something and, you know, I might miss a flight and everyone else is freaking out about missing the flight, I'm the one who's just like chilling, and that's just how I am. I'm not volatile at all. I don't yell at people. I don't raise my voice. It's really, really hard to get me angry. And I've been like that since a child. And I'm just wired that way. That's just a personality trait. You know, it's so, it's so interesting because like on the pandemic, there's like five or six accounts. Yours is one of them where I tend to look for not that you're an epidemiologist, but I like, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> I, 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 there's a few people who seem to be good curators of, of information and yeah. seem to be rising above the polarization that happens around this virus. And I like yeah. to, I like to look at all the data and then interpret it myself and explain it to people so that it's understandable in the way I understand it without being polarized. And there's very few yeah. people like that because if they're polarized, you can't convince them one way or the other on this, mm -mm. on this pandemic, if they have a certain belief. And when the reality is this pandemic's four or five months old in the world, and we just don't know, there is no science about it. Like people's no. like, where's your double blind controlled study? Well, yeah. ask me again in four years, because that's when the first one is going to hit. Like mm -hmm. we have a long way to go before science has the final word on this. And people seem to, that's one of those things where you can tweet and people will be upset. Oh, yeah. But if you stick, if you stay calm and focus on what's the best for the public mm -hmm. health and how can I move that forward, I think that's a good quality, particularly if you could do it across the board, which it seems like you can do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it also, you know, and it also means that I'm sort of immune to a lot of the stuff that normally shuts other people up. Right. So if someone does say, oh, you know, 
they see a picture of me not wearing a mask and they say, oh, I'm going to you know, kill your grandma or whatever. Like that would rattle a lot of people, right? A lot of the stuff that people say to me or like, you know, when people are getting hostile with me or insulting me or whatever, they always think that they're going to like stop me by saying a certain word, right? Or using a certain argument. And it's like, if it's, an, if it's something that's emotionally based and it's just ad hominem, I don't care. Like I, I, I legit don't care. So yeah, it's like, okay, that might work on 90% of people, but like, no, like you, if, if you want to, you have to actually come with an argument here. If you want to like, you know, you, you can't just call me a name and think, yeah. okay, that's going to shut them up. It's like, no, like, what's your argument? It, it's interesting because I would say in terms of response, I'm similar to you, but I didn't come mm. at it the same way. Like I'm a okay. more anxious person. I had to just get used to the uh, nonstop, you know, <laughs> social media hate on things. Sure, sure, and sure. I've been writing for the public since 2002. So just after a few years, you just kind of get used to it, that it's going to happen a lot. But every now and then, sometimes someone presses a button and I, and I want to respond. And then I catch myself and realize this is insane. <laughs> but like, so let's say you have a Twitter strategy in place and you're building followers. Obviously, a part of that strategy is monetizing. How do you go about monetizing a Twitter following? Wow. Well, I think before thinking about any kind of monetization, it's important to have an audience that is really engaged with you and that trusts you. Right. I don't think, I think a lot, sometimes people try to turn the monetization on too early. I mean, I didn't start monetizing my Twitter much at all. I mean, I did little bits, you know, promoting my music and stuff, but I didn't really start monetizing it properly until 2019. In terms of how I do that, I just sell a lot of stuff. Like I, I've got my book, Strong Advice, Zuby's Guide to Fitness for Everybody. I've sold you know thousands of copies of that. I've now got my course. I sell a lot of merchandise. I do merchandise launches on Twitter. Um, and I also do coaching. So I coach a lot of people. I do life coaching. I do fitness coaching. I do social media coaching. Um, I get a lot of clients through Twitter and people have seen my own success on that. So a lot of people reach out to me and say, Hey, like I'm running this business or I'm trying to build my own personal brand, et cetera. Can you help me out with this? Can you give me some advice? Like all the, you know, what you've learned over the past decade, all this. So for me, those are the sort of primary channels. There are other people who do, you know, affiliate marketing and things like that. And also it's just great for driving people towards other platforms. So if I do have a new, new music or I've got a new um, podcast or I've got whatever, I can direct people to all of those different things. And Twitter is amazing for that. Also, just in terms of connecting with other people, right? That's how we connected. So many yeah. people who, who I've connected with, many of whom, you know, I, I massively respect and look up to people who have been sort of my online mentors in a way for several years. And now like they follow me on Twitter and I follow them and I can DM them and, you know, maybe I'll go on their podcast, they'll come on mine, et cetera. And there's just so much power in that. And it's incredible how the vast majority of people who use it just don't, don't see it and massively underutilize it. That's why I wanted to create the Conquering Twitter course because people are constantly complaining about Twitter. Oh, this platform is useless. It's a waste of time. It's garbage. It's terrible. I'm like, dude, this is like the most powerful social media platform out there as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think it's more powerful than Instagram. I think it's more powerful than Facebook. Um, I think Twitter, what you can do is incredible. You also say, you know, I, I think everybody feels a need to kind of dominate every social media platform, mm -hmm. but you also give, have the common sense to say, hey, focus on one or two yeah. and you're going to get just as powerful an audience. You, the, the, the real point is you want an engaged audience mm. that trusts what you have to say. Yeah, you need to build trust. Right. And so if you look good on video, YouTube could be the audience. Uh, if you like making 10 second Dances, TikTok could be the audience. I think Twitter does appeal to having a discussion with a large number of people and you know being engaged in ideas and and so on. So I think I think Twitter's good at that. What about like sort of smaller platforms like Quora or something like that? I think there's a lot of parallels between all the platforms in terms of what makes good content. Like I said, you know, informative and or entertaining. That goes across every medium, every platform, including ones that don't yet exist but will in the future. Those I think that's just a sort of immutable truth, right? You have to offer value to people. Um, but then also, you know, consistency, showing up and giving a lot more than you ask for. So, I mean, you, you've, you've done this over the years, right? So you, you have a blog, you do podcasts, et cetera. So you, you're like just all your blogs, man, you're just giving, 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 giving. And then you know what? Then when you do launch a book, you've given people so much and you've established this trust and this report, you know, I've bought, I think I've bought three of your books. 
right? Before we even, before we ever spoke. And that's because cool. Like, you know, this guy keeps, you know, he's giving, he's giving, he's giving. Oh, okay. He's got a book. Cool. Let me, let me, let me check out the book. Cause you already know that you already, you like the person you, they've given you a lot. So there's that sort of some semblance of reciprocity. Um, and you know, if they're offering something of value that's useful to you, then at that stage, it kind of becomes a no brainer. But if you just come straight out of the gate and, you know, ask, or you're just constantly asking, but not giving for giving anything, it's the same as, it's the same as any type of relationship. I mean, I don't view social media that differently to I view the, how I view the real world, right? How would you interact in a real world relationship? Would you just, uh, sort of run up to someone or, you know, just demand or, request a payment off saying no you'll introduce yourself you'll develop rapport you'll have a conversation you'll establish something and then you know later down the line you you help that person that person helps you you know you offer people stuff etc and the same comes when dealing with negativity right so i don't say anything on social media that i wouldn't say in real life that's one of my general rules so i'm not gonna like you know people say some crazy stuff to me sometimes i'm like i know there is no way on earth you would say that if I was standing in front of you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you just know it just wouldn't happen. And so I try to just apply the same rules that I do to real world interactions. Um, something I say in my course that people should remember is always remember that you are dealing with human beings. It's so easy when you're just on your phone or you're on your computer and you're just sort of seeing like avatars and words and pictures popping up. It's really easy to forget that there's a human being on the other end of every single tweet, every single Instagram post, every YouTube video, et cetera. And that makes it easy for people to go into this weird. We all know that people behave worse online, right? Um, but if you constantly keep in mind, okay, I'm talking to an actual human being here, then that helps you, whether you're dealing with something positive or negative, it helps you to communicate in a good and healthy fashion rather than just sort of getting lost in the hype. Yeah, no, I, uh, I think that's really great advice actually, except when you don't know sometimes if someone's a bot, but I never, I try, I try never <laughs> to respond to someone who's anonymous, but I like on, in your course, you have this one frame in the video. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll say you give, you give five very good points here. And it, you know, it's, it's the frame, how to build trust and engagement. So imagine this, you're thinking, should you tweet something or not? A, does it help solve people's problems, meaning health, wealth, or happiness? Mm -hmm. And you say, respond to every comment that is positive or valuable. Yeah. I don't often do that. And maybe that's a mistake. You've got a huge account, man. It's not going to be possible for you anymore. Did you do it though? I can't anymore. I mean, I get over a hundred thousand notifications a day just on Twitter. So it's totally oh impossible. Gosh. But until I had about 50,000 followers, then yeah, I did. And I recommend for people with a, someone with a smaller account who's trying to grow, then, and this goes for every platform. Yeah, I think you should respond to everything. And then uh, you say freestyle off the cuff content can outperform polished and planned. Mm -hmm. We talked about that. That's very true. Uh, this one I've never really done. Engage with people you admire, big or small. So oh, yeah. like, that's like if I were to say, you know, hey, Donald Trump, maybe you should think of, um, just shutting, just selling the post office to FedEx mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, I, might retweet uh, you. I don't know if anybody, <laughs> like, I, I, I feel like, um, I, I, or let's just, not, let's say it's not Donald Trump. Let's say it's, um, Kanye, Kanye. Mm -hmm. I, I really like, uh, the name, the birthday party. What a great name. I feel like I'm pandering a little bit. No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, look, if you're talking about someone who's got like, you know, the actual president of the USA or one of the most famous music musicians in the world it might be hard to get a response. I don't know. Trump retweeted one of my friends twice the other day. So yeah. he's certainly active on there. Um, I, in fact, I know Trump has retweeted quite a lot of people. I know, I know so a lot funny. of people who have been retweeted by him. So that's, that's certainly possible, but you know, I'm talking about, I don't know, say you're an account with 500 followers and I don't know, you're, it's an account with a hundred thousand followers or 10,000 or whatever you can, like, like I said, you know, it's a human being on the other end. Like, it's not hard to, it's not hard to sort of be seen. And if you are. No, that's true. Like I'm thinking of the times when people have reached out to me. Yeah. If it's a legit value add, mm -hmm. then I engage and respond and retweet yeah. or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure if someone is like, Hey James, like I just read your book, choose yourself. It's been, you know, it's been totally life-changing and I just wanted to say thank you. Right. You'll probably 
you'll probably respond to that. Like, assuming yeah. you see it, right? Yeah. Like I'd, I'd respond to that. I respond to anything like that. I'm not, I can't see that and then just ignore it. Just like I wouldn't, if someone came up to me in the street and said like, oh man, like your book changed my life. Like I'm not going to just walk past them. It's like, no, I'll, I'll, I'll reply. And then your final statement here is let your audience know that you appreciate them individually mm. and collectively. Yep. S similar thing, actually. Similar to what I was just saying, right? That That's part of the interaction is no matter how big your audience gets is, you know, once in a while, yeah, I just do the tweet like, yeah, guys, like, thank you so much for, like the other day, just this week, I hit half a million followers across my social media platforms collectively. I just said, guys, like, you know, thank you so much. Like, you know, yeah, two, year, two years ago, I had like 40,000. So thank you for, thank you for this. Thank you for everyone who buys my merchandise. Like I'm seeing people posting pictures in like Team Zuby hats and t-shirts. I was like, thank you. Like, thank you. Thank you. I've got like hundreds of books like in my apartment now, which I'm signing and I'm going to be packaging to ship off all over the world. It's like, thank you for buying my book, you know, just individually, collectively. Like, I think thank you is probably some version of thank you is probably my most used social media phrase whether it's in the dms or comments or mentions like i'm just constantly thanking people yeah no i think that i think that's a good i think that's important also because i think i'm always shy about doing that because i feel when you're thanking like a huge audience mm. it's there's a it's a little bit somehow feels for me like Oh, I'm so big. I'm thanking everyone. Like I feel for me to be to, for me to do it, it feels a little ego, but people do like to be thanked and acknowledged. Oh, and maybe yeah. I should be more comfortable with that. Yeah. You know, I mean, you got to remember I'm a musician, right? So like if I'm doing a concert, like I'm not going to do a show and not thank people for not thank people for coming out and thank people yeah. for, you know, of course, like that's thank you. Like you, you could be anywhere, but you've chosen to be here in this room and to listen to me rap. Like, thank you for coming. Like, let's, Let's hang out. If you want a photo, if you want me to sign anything, I'm going to be hanging out for the next hour. Like, come see me. So, so and, and, you know, I know, um, I know we've been talking for a long time, but the, 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 there is one component of all this is very interesting, which is the how to go viral stuff. And mm. then, you know, it's interesting. So you say controversial, shocking, uh, very relevant to a moment in time, you know, all inspiring, uh, very relatable, could be hilarious. Uh, it, and I still agree, though, it needs to be off the cuff and authentic. So you can't, like, plan it out like, oh, this is going to be great. This one, these 140 words are going to be fantastic. <laughs> to be honest, if you've, if you've been on a platform for a really long time and you've done it a few times, then you sort of can. But that takes, like, that takes like ninja level... <laughs> Ninja yeah. level social media skills. But most of the time, yeah, you know, it's like you just keep... That's why I recommend, you know, putting out a lot of content because if you put out 10 tweets, one of the, it's the same as an album, right? Not every song you make is going to be a home run. Like not every single song is your best song. So you've got to just make a bunch of them. And, you know, I think a, I think quantity is extremely important for a lot of reasons. Obviously quality is important, but mm -hmm. quantity gives you practice, mm -hmm. gives you higher odds for quality. Mm -hmm. And somebody told me something very interesting once. It was like six years ago. A, a rapper told me this. I said to him, do you get upset if you put out a song that nobody likes? And he said, no, those are the songs everyone forgets. I just go on to the next song. Yeah. And it's yeah. true. It's the same thing with like a social media post. You put out something nobody likes, and if, but if you like it, mm -hmm. all right, that's fine. You got some practice and nobody else is going to remember because nobody else even saw it. You just yeah. move on. <laughs> and, and look, even the stuff that is is not the most popular thing. There's still people who like it, you know, like yeah. there's every song on every album is somebody's favorite. All right. You might have one. Okay. Like 50% of people all think this one is their favorite, right? Like this is the hit single, but you know, track 17, there are still thousands of people who like, Oh, like that's their, that's their favorite track on them. I can think of many, many music albums from many artists who like my favorite song on the album is not the, it's not the one that was the big hit, right? It's not like the big single or the club anthem or whatever. It's just like, oh, that track there is one that, you know, I really, really love and I think is very underrated. Um, and that, to be honest, that happens a lot. It happens a lot with a Jay-Z to be particular, actually. We were talking about Jay-Z earlier. That Like Jay-Z's singles are very rarely the best songs on the albums as far as I'm concerned. Ah, it's interesting. Well, yeah. I wonder if it happens. Like I noticed this with my own 
writing, sometimes I'll write something and I, when I hit publish, I absolutely do not care if it gets likes or engagement. I know mm-hmm. deep down this is good. And yes. often when I feel that way, it won't get the likes or engagement. But like you said, if you're, if you're experienced in something and you do something enough, you know what will, what will get the likes. So if mm-hmm. I write you know, 10 things I've learned from Steve Jobs or something like yeah. that, that'll get huge engagement and likes, mm-hmm. but it's not going to be the best written story. It's not going to even be a story really. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I find that um, the things I enjoy the most uh, don't always, you know, unlock the safe in terms of unleashing mm-hmm. a viral thing. So you kind of, it's good to balance, you know, when you're going viral and shocking and the stuff that you absolutely know is high value for you. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you're a creator, you're an artist, you're an entrepreneur, you're a, you're a person. It's like not everything... You know, this is the benefit of being independent. It's like not everything has to be a hit, right? Yeah. If, I, if I were working for some big record label or, you know, whatever, then yeah, I'm under the pressure. I'm under pressure to constantly like be cranking out inverted commas hits. But it's like, no, like my songs don't have to be hits. I can just make the music that I like and make the songs that I want to put out. And some people will like them more than others. Like, it, it's not going on the album if I don't like it, right? I like all the songs on my album. I like all of them, right? Some, someone might say, oh, this is the best one or that's the best one. I like all of them. You know, I wouldn't have put it on the album otherwise. And so, you know, I'm, I'm the artist, so you can't get so obsessed about the result that you forget the process or you compromise the process or you don't make something you just want to make or you don't write a blog that you just want to write because you're thinking, oh, it might not get as many likes is the last one. I think, I think once someone starts thinking like that, then that's sort of like a, a little bit of a creative death spiral. Cause then you're just constantly trying to make that, yeah. you know, get, make that YouTube video that's going to get a million views or then, put out that tweet. The yeah. Then you're in the prison. So what's, what's next for you? What's what are you up to? Man, it's a great question. Um, so I'm going to start writing my next album um, in the next few months. I've got about 10 brand new beats. And I've got some where, ideas. Where do you get the beats? Like, do you make the beats? You said earlier you don't make the yeah, beats. Yeah, I don't make beats. I've never made a beat in my life. Um, but I work with producers all over the world. People send me stuff all the time. Um, sometimes Is there any I kind of like library out. of public beats that you also maybe could buy a beat yeah, from? Yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of, most producers have their own websites. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of just browse there. Producers will just send me links or they'll just drop box stuff to me and send me beats and say, hey, I've got like these 10 beats. Give them a listen. So it works like that a lot. Um, and then I just go through things and, you know, I'll listen to a hundred beats and I might like three or four of them will be ones that I want to use. So I've got that coming up. Um, my podcast, real talk with Zuby still coming out every Friday as standard. I've got trying to get some, uh, really, really awesome guests lined up for this year. Um, I'm going to keep promoting and pushing my book. I will do another book in the future, but that's not immediately on the horizon. And then, yeah, with the coaching, podcasting, all of that stuff, it all, it all keeps going. Live music, obviously, everything live is on hold for now. To be honest with you, um, I already do everything I want to do. I probably do too many things already. Um, I just want to do everything on a bigger scale to a bigger audience, get better at it, improve the quality, everything like that. I'm not really looking to add any additional strings to the bow at this stage. I've kind of got like six or seven jobs as it is, so I just want to keep doing it and doing it better. I, I think that's smart. I think every now and then I go a little over the edge on on taking on too many things that happened mm-hmm. to me with this lockdown. Like, oh, I got all this <laughs> free time now because I had all these all this comedy stuff planned and I canceled seven different trips. Oh wow! Um, and so I I wrote a book. I started a company. I I started doing five episodes a week of the podcast. Oh and wow! I I, I I did bit off a little bit more than I could chew. So right now I'm in a period where I'm trying to. Um, ease it off. But um, in any case, Zuby, thanks so much for, for coming on. I always learn from everything you do and put out and your tweets are in fact great and Thank educational <laughs> and entertaining, but I like your music. I like your videos, uh, podcasts. I've been on your podcast and thanks for reaching out to me. I really appreciate it. Like I, I, I value that you did that. I, I, I appreciate that you did that. Uh, thank you very much, James. It's, it's always an honor. And likewise, much love and respect. I'm a big fan of everything you do. Excellent. Thanks so much. You're welcome.
the McNugget Buddies are back. But this time, they got a fresh look as part of the new Kerwin Frost Box at McDonald's. We're talking all new buddies, dressed head to toe in the freshest fits, all designed by the artist Kerwin Frost. So when you order the Kerwin Frost Box with your choice of 10-piece McNuggets or a Big Mac, you'll get one of the flyest McNugget Buddies to go with it. Think you can collect them all? Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. I'm loving it. At participating McDonald's for a limited time, while supplies last.